My guest today is Professor Dean Bonamano, who is Professor of Behavioral Neuroscience and Neurobiology at UCLA. The primary goal of his laboratory is to understand the neural basis or temporal information processing. Welcome, Dean. Well, thank you very much for having me, Gil. Yeah, thanks for doing this. So uh, you sent me a few papers. I want to start with one of the older papers. Uh, you've been working in this area for a long time the biology of time across different scales from 2007. Uh, you say animals time even some scales that span from microseconds to days, in contrast to the technologies devised by humans to keep track of time, biology has developed vastly different mechanisms for timing across these different scales. Yeah, that makes a lot of intuitive sense. Um, the only thing I wondered, Dean, is whether humans have really devised methods to keep track of time. I, you know, when, when I go to sleep, I sometimes go to sleep thinking about falling into a black hole. And uh, they tell me that um, the, an external observer will never see me entering the black hole um, because of the time dilation effects. And so, have, uh, so time has been a very, very difficult concept, both in physics and in neuroscience. Uh, do you think we have a really good understanding of time? I, I think, first place, yes. I think time is a, one of the most perplexing questions there is. It's at the core of many, at a perfect storm of unsolved scientific ministries, right? From quantum gravity to relativity to free will to consciousness. Um, and I, I don't think we have a universal agreement as to a theory of time or what time is. But I think in large part, Gil, that's a bit perhaps an illusion because it's not one problem. Time is many different problems. And I think this is part of the challenges to sort of um, tease apart which what we mean by time. So um, human beings have been attempting to track time, to tell time since the dawn of civilization. And we've reached a point in technology which is truly astounding, right? We can measure time better than anything else. So I think you've, as you probably know, the current definition of a meter is not a distance. It's it's defined by how much light travels in a second, um, or I'm sorry, in a billionth of a second, I should say, probably. Um, so we've achieved this, this state in technology that time is the thing we um, are most able to measure but in perhaps least understand. So it's a bit of a paradox. Now, um, when it comes to the brain, um, it's very much the opposite in terms of how the brain tells time. If you have a quartz watch, for example, it's an amazing device, right? You can tell milliseconds to seconds to minutes to hours to days. Um, but the brain has doesn't have a master clock. It has very different ways to tell time on the millisecond scale, on the second scale, on the hour scale, and on the day scale. Yeah, so it's, it's an amazing thing. So, um, I mean, I didn't know this before reading some of the papers, Dean, that, and so, if I understand this correctly, we have different mechanisms in the brain for different scales of time, days, months, years, seconds, minutes, and so on. Um, it sort of makes sense from an evolutionary perspective, right? So so do you think the brain um, initially was more of a day-based system and then we sort of developed these algorithms as we progressed in time? <laughs> yeah, but what do you think has happened to the brain? Yeah. So one way to look at it is the brain has many clocks, but unlike the clocks on our on our on our wall or on our wrist, um, which have a second hand, a minute hand, an hour hand. The brain has one clock that just has an hour hand, has another timer that just has a second hand, another timer that just has a minute hand. Um, so these clocks evolved independently because they're independent problems, right, Gail? One problem is to predict when the sun will rise. That problem evolved under different constraints than the problem of knowing when a predator will attack or when food will be available. So the, the brain um, evolved different mechanisms to cope with these problems because they're independent problems, although they're linked by the need to tell time. So with, um, but it's important to remember, 
that on the hour scale, on the day scale, for example, the circadian uh, time that tells us, allows us to synchronize our sleep-wake cycle, our eating habits, and so forth. That circadian clock, you don't even need a brain. So single cell organisms and plants have circadian clocks. And indeed, those clocks in many ways are some of the most precise the, in biology. But, um, but no, so, so, but those circadian clocks have no idea how many days have elapsed or how many seconds have elapsed. So they're fundamentally different mechanisms. Yeah, that, that's so interesting, Dean. So the circadian clock mechanism from, uh, I think, life originated on Earth maybe three billion, three and a half billion years ago, and Earth has been spinning at this rate <laughs> for that long. So that the 24-hour cycle is something very fundamental to Earth. And so every biological system had that algorithm built into them um, from bacteria onward, right? Correct, and it's it's fascinating to ask, why would a bacteria care what time it is? And um, why do plants care what time it is? And I think intuitively you probably know one of those answers, which is anything that does photosynthesis, of course, cares about when the sun will rise quick and start the, the cellular machinery to begin absorbing the sun's energy to create um, uh, glucose and uh, carbohydrates in general. But interestingly, it seems that one of the first evolutionary drives to, to or evolutionary pressures for the circadian clock to evolve was reproduction. And for early organisms, particularly bacteria-like organisms, they had to divide the DNA. And the DNA, as you probably know, is very sensitive to UV light um, because the UV light is highly mutagenic, which is why we buy um, sunscreens with a little UV um, absorption and, and SPF factors. So bacteria apparently evolved um, under pressure to divide at night. So they could predict when night was going to uh, happen and engage the mach uh, cellular machinery involved for reproduction um, to do that in the absence of the ultraviolet uh, um, influences. But interestingly, it's interesting, we think of it as a clock, but I make this point um, that the brain is ultimately a prediction machine. So the brain's primary function in many ways, I may be exaggerating a bit, is to predict the future. And if you think about the circadian clock, we call it a clock, but it's really a prediction device, right? It's predicting when the temperature will change, it's predicting when the, the light, um, the sun will come out and when, when I should eat and food availability and so forth. So timers, I like to remind people that timers are in many ways prediction devices. Yeah, that, that's a really interesting way to think about it. So uh, in some sense, you know, we, we have a lot of development now in machine learning. Uh, you've done a lot of work in this area too. So you get a lot of labor cases over time uh, for the mechanism and they create, you know, some sort of a heuristic in terms of prediction, optimizes when it should divide, when it should do whatever it wants to do. And that continues all through the biological system. So, so time then is really fundamental to life in the sense that without time, we cannot live, right? We, we, we won't be able to make the right decisions. I Yes, I, I would agree with that statement, particularly because life itself is a dynamical system. It doesn't make sense to think of life in the absence of change. Um, and, and ultimately, we can get into the philosophy of this a bit, but what, what do we mean by time? And this is a, a very um, philosophically uh, challenging area because people have very different views. But to some, and I would agree with this, what we mean by time, most of the time, sorry, is that it's a way to quantify change. So clock time, we, we, you know, we said, let's meet at a given time. So what we mean by that is to synchronize our actions in a way that we can uh, 
agree on some metric that quantifies change. So the world is changing, physics, the laws of physics determine some rate of change. And what we do is scientists and, and humans have invented ways to quantify that change and, con and, and create a metric that's consistent across space and time, if you will. Um, so yeah. I think that gets to this issue of in the biology, going back to your question, um, yes, I, it doesn't make sense to try to think of life or decision making without time because the currency of evolution is survival and reproduction. And those are future oriented tasks, right? So everything in, in deep down in life is sort of future oriented. Yeah, so I don't know if it was Einstein or, or somebody else. And so um, we cannot really have uh, a universe without motion. So motion is fundamental to the universe. Um, and, and similarly, time is fundamental to a biological entity because without change, we cannot be living, right? Uh, in some sort, of, does, does it follow? I think so. I would say that change is fundamental to physics and biology and so forth. Now, the deeper question is in physics, there's this, and physics and philosophy, I guess, there's this contrast or dichotomy between two views of time. One is called eternalism, and eternalism comes from this idea that of the block universe, this four-dimensional universe in which the past, present, and future are in, in some sense equally real. Um, so the idea is that the past is still exist, and then the language here is loaded um, because our language is, is not made to have these discussions. But um, the idea is that the universe itself is a four-dimensional block and all of time is essentially laid out, if you will. The other opposing view is presentism, in which only the present is real. Importantly, there's no absolute present. Um, my present, the, the rate my clock ticks might be different from the, from the rate your clock ticks because we might be going at different velocities or have different um, gravitational potentials. But all that is real is your local present. The past no longer exists and the future is yet to exist. And these two views have very different implications for how we think of time and the universe in terms of um, if, if free will exists, if everything has in a sense already been laid out, if the course of uh, the universe is in, in, a, set, in a sense already set, in, in stone or not. Yeah, so I have to say, Dean, I don't know anything about this, but I'm attracted to the idea of a block universe. Mm -hmm. I'm I'm attracted to the idea that, you know, the space time is sort of a construct that we are sort of moving through and, and everything is there, everything has been done. Um, and, and so, you know, obviously has some <laughs> implications for, uh, for, for larger questions. Um, but but I want to get into another paper of yours from 2010, uh, population clocks, motor timing with neural dynamics. So you say an understanding of sensory and motor processing will require elucidation of the mechanisms by which the brain tells time. Open questions relate to whether timing relies on dedicated or intrinsic mechanisms and whether distinct mechanisms underlie timing across scales and modalities. So I always wondered about this, you know, I mean, time, timing is such a beautiful thing. You know, I, I think about sports sometimes. Yeah, I, I grew up uh, playing cricket. Uh, I played some tennis. I have watched baseball. Um, that, you know, that, that microseconds of difference is basically they're going to get caught on the boundary or uh, get, a, get a, a home run on a sixer, right? Um, so how does the brain do this? I mean, they get all the sensory inputs and they just to finely tune that motor mechanism to, to make this happen, right? Yeah, that's a great question. And I couldn't agree more, you know, in sports and in life, timing is everything, right? And um, 
this conversation you and I are having, you're paying attention to the pause and duration of the syllables coming out of my mouth. And if I stop for too long, you are going to think that I was asking a question or that I forgot what I was going to say. So your brain is continuously timing the pause for each word that comes out of my, my mouth. It's unconscious, of course. So this just goes to reiterate what we were talking about before, that time is of fundamental importance for survival and decision making and navigating the world. So the question is, is precisely that. How does the brain tell time? And when we look at man-made clocks, they can be incredibly complicated. They can be fairly simple from a pendulum, um, but incredibly complicated devices from an atomic clock. But interestingly, they have the concept is pretty simple, right? By and large, they rely on a oscillator, something that's ticking away at a certain uh, rate and counting the ticks of those oscillations. So it could be the pendulum, just each swing of the pendulum, or the electromagnetic very, um, uh, frequency of the cesium atom in case of an atomic clock. So that's so they're basically oscillator-based mechanisms. So that was very influential in, in, in terms of the brain. So maybe the brain has an oscillator that's, that's ticking away at some rate and some other circuit that's counting those ticks. We and others have argued that that's not the case. Um, and I think it, in, that's increasingly well accepted now, that the brain's timer is not based on, most of the brain's timers aren't based on an oscillator and the ability to count the ticks of those oscillators. The brain is the most complex dynamical system we know of, right? So it's, it makes some sense that the brain uses its own dynamics to tell time. So neurons have time constants, they have dynamics, just like if you imagine a skier skiing down, you like sports, so here's an analogy, right? If you like a downhill skier um, and they're, they're going down the mountain, and, and in the Olympics, for example, the t they can all make it down the mountain in maybe two, um, two minutes and 10 seconds, and 100 milliseconds or 200 milliseconds, but it's very close, right? So the skiers themselves are essentially a dynamical system. And you could, in principle, use the skiers to tell time. So you could say, okay, well, they're halfway, maybe one minute has gone by. So any dynamical system, in principle, can be used to tell time. And neurons are these beautifully complex dynamical systems. So one neuron can activate neuron uh, one can activate neuron two, which can activate neuron three, which can activate neuron four. And you have this chain of activity. You have this dynamic flow of information through this simple feed forward chain. And what we and others have um, put forth is that the brain uses its internal neural dynamics as a clock. And this is why we call it a, a neural population clock. So if you think of neurons, neurons are these very interesting uh, computational elements. Each neuron can excite or connect to thousands of other uh, neurons, can excite or inhibit those. So if you activate some group of those neurons, that will activate another group, which might in turn feed back and partially activate some of those, but you have this dynamical pattern. And as long as that can be reproduced, then you can use that to tell time. And both experimental and uh, theoretical work has shown that that suggested that is indeed the case. Yeah, so so I want to dig a little deeper into that, uh, Dean. So I was talking to one of your colleagues recently, and you know I was asking her, um, do neurons have a personality? <laughs> uh, you know, it's a democratic system. It's a pattern finding machine, and they have to collaborate, compete, uh, come together to make a decision. Um, so the, the sort of the, the history of a, of, a, of a neuron, does it actually impart a personality um, on the neuron in terms of firing and what it's expected to given some inputs? Um, is, is, that, is that possible? I think that's a fair question. Each neuron has a unique experience and that experience shapes some of its properties, some of its input-output functions and some of its uh, synaptic strengths. I think, uh, and I think we can explore that a bit. 
but you're interested in artificial intelligence. So it is, it is useful to compare the neurons with transistors, for example. So they both have their own hardware, right? So the hardware of the brain, if you will, is neurons, the hardware of, um, of, of von Neumann serial computers are VLSI chips, which are made of the transistors. And if you compare those two things, neurons are very extroverted computational devices, right? Each neuron communicates with um, ten, maybe thousands or tens of thousands of other neurons. Transistors are, are very introverted, right? Transistor, in most circuits, a transistor will communicate with maybe a dozen or so other transistors. So the information is very constrained. And that really, that simple observation really shapes a lot how those two systems work. So you and I, once we think of something, it's contaminated by everything else. So you say baseball, you might think of cricket, you might think of your home team, you might think of the World Series, you might think of throwing a ball up in the air, playing catch with your uh, children, and so forth. Because the information is so diverse, because it's, it spreads out so easily, and computers don't don't work like that. So the hardware that our 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 brain is made of really influences how it's designed. Now back to your question. Yes, within okay. So that's neurons in general. But in a sense, I think each neuron we can say it has its own personality, if you will, in the sense that it's um, shaped by its own experience. So neurons they can become less excitable or or, or more excitable depending on if they were recently activated or not. So they do shape, they do have a unique um, personality, which again is very different from computers, right? A transistor, the transistors are totally um, interchangeable and they don't, they don't specialize. Yeah, so from, from an evolutionary perspective, um, the, the design uh, introduces a lot of noise, if I understand this correctly, uh, Dean, a lot of noise I mean, if we sort of grew up with transistors in our brain, I think there'd be less innovation. We might not have been uh, able to survive the predators that attacked us. So, so uncertainty and noise were really requirements for survival. So it looks like the design was really sort of in that direction, right? We are not looking for precision, but we're looking for a lot of noisy information to be processed. I think that's a fascinating uh, perspective, Gil. And, you know, in computer science, noise is generally seen as a negative, right? You try to decrease um, the, the increase or maximize the reliability of a transistor. So it does the same thing um, the same way billions and billions of times. And in many times, even in neuroscience, we think of noise as something bad. But I think you're absolutely correct that noise is sort of evolution's um, way to make a lot of bets at once, sort of to ensure that, well, maybe these animals or this brain won't survive, but these other ones will because they're noisy. So they're always exploring the, the landscape. And you know from machine learning that the learning algorithms are about minimizing, exploring the landscape and sort of their noise is important, right? Where you're trying to use, say, backprop to explore the landscape and find some sort of optimal solution. And the noise in the brain might be doing something similar. So yes, neurons are noisy. And I think that's sometimes a bug, but probably more often than not, it's probably a feature. It's probably a good feature. So pattern finding, we are really good at pattern finding. We just very really recently got to some level of competence in silicon machines in terms of pattern findings. It took us a long time yeah. <laughs> to actually actually get there. Uh, but, but the brains are really efficient in, in pattern finding. It has some downsides though, because I think that pattern finding comes biases, um, you know, all sorts of things, right? Um, uh, I think you talk about this and we get into your other papers. You talk about this sort of two sides of the brain. Um, one that sort of kicks in, takes some information, makes a quick decision, and the other sort of sits back and, and looks at sort of the, the big picture and, and makes a decision. 
Um, is there is there a difference with the left and right brain here, Dean, or is this just a, just a concept that that's not true? I think the the concept of having two systems in the brain that are driving our decision and cognition is a very important one. And we talk about these systems as as sometimes the the automatic system or the associative system versus, say, the reflective system. Um, sometimes it's called the fast system and the slow system or system one, system two. And nobody should take home that one of these is left hemisphere, one of these is right hemisphere, one of these is the cerebellum, one of this is the hippocampus. So the sort of the anatomical um, dichotomy between those things is far from clear. So, so we should not think of that as two physically anatomically distinct systems. But nevertheless, they, they are two sort of different subroutines that are running. And an example of this is, say, if I ask you, uh, what do cows drink? I think most people um, will think of the first thing that pops into their head is milk. But then that's their automatic system. But then they might say, even before they say um, milk, they say, oh, no, 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 it's water. Cows drink water. Um, so those are the two reflect. That's the two systems right there. One is the automatic, just based on associations, that is critical for pattern recognition, um, and the other is um, sort of more reflective and slower. And both are incredibly important. But we can be led to make very bad decisions. You probably know this again, in terms of advertising and marketing, the way things are framed um, influence our decisions. So a company will say. Um, this this product works 80% um, of the time, or this drug works 80% of the time. They'll never say it fails 20% of the time. Um, so, so this ability to make associations, this ability to recognize patterns can be exploited and lead us to make poorer decisions um, by things like the framing effect and, and, and anchoring effect and so forth. So, so there are clearly two systems in the brain, um, but the popular idea of the left and right brain, we don't know where the systems reside. It's a complex network of functions. Yeah. Um, but again, from an evolutionary perspective, it makes a lot of sense. Um, when the lion jumps out from, from behind the bush, uh, you don't want to be very reflective. Uh, you, you want quick action. Um, and then there is a time for reflection. Uh, so both of the systems have had uh, good use, I would imagine. Um, do, do, do we have any data on, I mean, we, we, we've been here only for a short period of time, 100,000 years. Do we have any data on if the brain has changed over time? Yeah. Um... So clearly both systems um, are the product of evolution. There's a time and place for each one. And I think one concern is that the time and place for that those systems were optimized is a time and place we no longer inhabit, right? As you just said, say Homo sapiens evolved uh, maybe 100 to 200,000 years ago, they, we, we don't longer live in that world. So in many ways, um, our operating system, if you will, and I just use that as sort of a metaphor, is, is archaic. And I think there's profound consequences to that in the current world. So take something like fear. So we evolve, fear is something incredibly rational in the sense that it can help you survive. If the lion attacks you, and being fearful of um, human beings from another tribe that you're not familiar with can also be life-saving in that environment that we grew up in. So arguably, our automatic system grew up or was programmed to have an implicit bias against people outside our tribes. Now, that's very um, dangerous and very um, ineffective because we live in a, a bound world in which most of the time we're collaborating and cooperating with each other. Um, so, so we have these sort of archaic subroutines again in our brain that have to be overcome with reflection. Um, 
and so take you know we have a natural fear of sharks and predators and so forth you know those really don't help us that much for survival anymore do they um so our reality is different so i think your question is has the brain changed um and, and i think the answer is I, I i wish it had but i don't think it has i think it's evolutionary too short. too short a time frame so, so i want to ask you this this is not in the paper and uh, it's not a political question um because of that fast systems um are we in a regime where you know i see this you know when i'm with talking with uh, democrats or talking with republicans uh, there's a set of expectations that are set in it, it seems like you know the fast systems are in total control um, there is really no reflection <laughs> on any data <laughs> that i can see so you know, we have 75 million people going in one direction, 75 million going in another direction. Are we sort of locked into this this idea that we cannot really get away from? Obviously, that's one factor. But, you know, human beings are incredibly complex. There's a mixture of culture, peer pressure, um, susceptibility to misinformation, the automatic system, the reflective system. Um, the balance between those. So there's a lot of factors there. And, but clearly we behave irrationally in, on, many, um, on many issues. Um, and, you know, it's sort of going along this political divide. You know, I think the, in many ways the, the vaccine um, hesitancy movement is, is a good example, right? Oh. The, the notion of injecting a pathogen into one's body doesn't sound like a good idea, right? <laughs> so, <laughs> so, so it's easy to see how the fast system could jump to a conclusion that makes people um, vaccine hesitancy, so the, the, the hesitant towards vaccines. So the way I think about it is convincing people that vaccines are bad is a bit like as, is it pretty much as hard as it is to convince people that snakes don't make good pets, right? <laughs> because we, we already are born essentially with a bias against snakes. So I think we're already born or the brain has already a, a programmed in subroutine that makes us hesitant to embrace the idea of having pathogens pretty much if we, I mean, and, and, and to be clear, Vaccines aren't about injecting pathogens, right? They're just parts of those pathogens or just triggers of, of those. To, um, but nevertheless, it's easy to see how that innate fear could be exploited to make people make decisions that put their own lives in danger. So we live in a world now, we used to live in a world in which death by infectious diseases was a very, very serious problem. Um, it killed devastated um, human populations and, and populations of many animals throughout throughout history. Paradoxically, we've been able through intellectual development and science and culture to reach a point where we can um, combat many of those infections um, through vaccines. But now, in many ways, the more serious bug is is the brain. Right, because the brain is what's preventing, in many cases, people from embracing a life-saving technology. So I think that's, in in many ways, a powerful example of how the brain's archaic operating system can be exploited to to for, to, to make people make decisions that are not in their own best interests. So it's counter-evolution, right? People are making decisions that will not enhance their chances of survival, but decrease their chances of survival. Yeah, I mean, we need a we need an update to come through from Microsoft or, or Apple. <laughs> you know? um, do you see any sort of policy um, prescriptions here? So, so suppose you know we understand the problem in this context. Uh, do you see any policy interventions that might be useful? 
I, I wouldn't pretend to know the answer to that question. I think the the solutions, and I talk about this in in, in Brain Bugs, uh, the book, about this debugging. So what can we do to better address the the non optimal aspects of of how our brains work, the brain bugs, if you will. I think so, and I think there's there's a multi-dimensional approach there one is clearly education right so but not necessarily just education about um, reading writing and arithmetic but i think education has to focus a bit on the brain it's to help people understand their own brains to understand the natural strengths and weaknesses of our brains it's you know we need we need to read the brain's manual to better understand um, how it works and to make better decisions um, so that's number one. I think education and neuroscience education, I think, in my opinion at least, is 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 important. Um, regarding policy decisions, that's a much more difficult question. But I think um, what people call um, sort of a choice architecture, what other people have called in terms of encouraging making rules and regulations that encourage people to make decisions that are generally agreed upon to enhance quality of life. So the standard example of choice architecture is say, when you go get a driver's license, you might have a option that says, um, do you want, in a case of an accident or death, do you want to donate, um, be an organ donor? And the default is generally no. Um, but by making the default yes, that's something that improves both through peer pressure and both through um, having more availability of organs, the quality of life of other human beings. So, so but those policy decisions, yeah, as I said, I don't, I, I think they're incredibly important, but they're hard to generally agree upon. But making vaccines mandatory, I think, is something that's absolutely an example of a policy um, decision that um, is in most parts of the world well accepted and implemented, um, but that's important for um, society at large. So yeah, I think those types of policy decisions are important. Yeah, so um, I, I think the education part is absolutely needed, but there's, uh, there's different types of education, right? One is One type of education is asking questions. Um, the ability to ask questions and use information to reach the right conclusion. It is a process of education, not the content of education. Uh, uh, you know, my, my feeling is that we, we focus a lot on the content of education, but not the process. I'm, I have to say, Dean, I'm not a big fan of um, asking people to do something prescriptively, um, because I think it sort of sets us back. Uh, I don't believe this is the only iteration of COVID. <laughs> we will have a COVID 2024 coming. Uh, I, I hate to be too pessimistic about this. So, uh, you know, it, we have to get people sort of understand the implications really well, right? So suppose United Airlines and Pfizer and Hewlett Packard go out and say, hey, if you want to come to work, you have to get vaccinated you'll get good compliance, but I don't know if it is really sort of, um, it's going to be there in the next iteration. That's what I fear. I see, so your point is that in in our example, which I think we're both using just as, as, as a metaphor maybe, that for vaccine compliance, it's more effective to rely on education because that will prepare people for future pandemics, for example, than say mandatory vaccination if you work for in a hospital or something is that is that sort of what the yeah point that, that's, that's what i'm thinking i mean I, I obviously don't know a lot about this but yeah. um yeah that's my intuition i and i know i agree with that in an ideal world i think obviously we would like to live in a world where people agreed or the vast majority of people um made the rational or rational science and by rational here I mean the scientifically agreed upon decision what's the scientific um, 
decision that benefits society as a whole the as a as as a whole the most and so that is to be vaccinated now to what extent the government should make those policies um, implement those policies are obligatory or provide incentives I, that's a difficult question but let me put this out there that you know ultimately the government's role is primarily you know i remember my father telling me this early on and it's something that really stuck with me you know i think the government's role is really to protect um each other protect us from each other um, mm -hmm. more so than yeah. ourselves so i think I'm, I'm all for individual freedom but when it comes to those decisions that impact others so you know this is as trivial as driving under the speed limit you know i'm all for freedom and should I be able to drive at 100 miles an hour? Well, that would be my freedom. But no, because that impacts the safety of others. And I think vaccines, um, while we should absolutely strive for education, if that's not working, I think it is appropriate. And it has been because throughout, throughout, throughout history, um, recent history in the US at least, um, it's required, for example, if you're coming, if you're migrating in from Brazil, for example, you have to have a certain sets of vaccines, right? Um, so I don't think these, there's nothing new about requiring people to be vaccinated. Um, but I agree, it's a, t it's a difficult um, solution into where to, how to best coax people to um, have the best compliance possible. And yeah, I don't know the answer either, Gail. I don't know the answer either. No, no, no. It, it, so, so we are we are moving a little bit away from your papers, but I just want to touch on this. So, there's a robust utilitarian argument for prescribing vaccines. I mean, we lost eight million people approximately in Brazil and India, just in Brazil and India. <laughs> um, if you really, you know, the, the numbers uh, don't quite work. Um, and so we might we might end up with 10 to 15 million people dying from this episode. And so there is a robust utilitarian argument to say even if an individual is taking some level of risk, which is almost minuscule, it is worth that risk for society. Now, the, the problem is, does the individual really understand that? Um, you know, one third of the population in the U.S. appear not to understand it. Um, and so so then the question is, can we really become practical uh, about prescriptive policies? That's what I, I worry about. So you're saying that, again, that education is, is perhaps the best um, method to achieve these these desired outcomes in which you have high vaccination rates. I mean, I, I, I get that, Gil, but I don't really see the difference between many, so many of the other um, other uh, laws or, or, or regulations that we put. So again, whether it's wearing a seatbelt or driving at the speed limit or not harming people or not being violent towards um, towards our 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 fellow human beings i mean i think there's always some percentage of people that would say well i don't understand why i can't drive above the speed limit um so yeah i don't know i don't have um i think both are necessary i really do i think you do need to have rules and regulation i mean again in terms of what again false news is a good example right <laughs> is do, should we have regulations to that prevent people from um putting misinformation and divulging misinformation whether it's that the, the election was was a lie or that the election was rigged and and yes i i think the government should have rules um to rein in how information is spread but but it's an incredibly fraught problem right and and there's always well what's misinformation right at what point so these are not these are not discrete binary black and white problems i agree yeah i mean it comes back to your um, research area too dean so the biological systems show a great variety of uncertainty 
Yeah, yeah. let's put it that way. Yeah. Yeah. Um, physical laws, physical systems, we can really deterministically show, um, you know, wearing a seatbelt or driving less than uh, X kilometers per hour are good things. Uh, we cannot deterministically show, uh, you know, the effect on a biological system um, of, of something going in there. So that is one of the issues that we are dealing with, I think. Um, and, and like you say, there's so much misinformation out there. So, so we do cross-sectional analysis. We don't know what a vaccine is going to do for Joe or Savvy, but we say, you know, there is 99.99% chance that nothing is going to happen, uh, but that will never be 100%. So how does people internalize that information? That is, that is one of the problems that we have. Yeah, so again, something unique about the brain is that it wasn't, it didn't evolve to understand numbers, right? It didn't evolve to understand probabilities. And like, if I ask you, if I ask someone, you know, I'm going to throw four coins in the air, what's the probability two will land heads up? People want to say the probability is a half. That's actually not correct. Um, turns out to be six sixteenths because we, we can go over that. But our ability to, to digest or to incorporate large numbers like vaccine safety is, is one in a million that, uh, that you have serious side effects. And I, don't, and I don't know the numbers, so I don't want anybody to take that number seriously um, of, of one in the million. Um, so people really struggle on saying, well, what does that mean? And because of something called the confirmation bias, if you already have um, a propensity or reasons or an opinion formed, you're going to say, oh, I heard about this one person who had a bad reaction or developed an autoimmune response or something to the vaccine. Um, and again, you said it's hard to know exactly what happens um, to because when at the individual level to the vaccine, I don't know if I fully agree with that. Um, it's 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 probabilistically we pretty damn sure what what it's going to happen. But at the same time, it's pretty. I think part of the problem is is that when a hundred million people get vaccinated, some of those people are going to develop. Um, some responses, whether they're related or not to the vaccine. Um, so it's equally hard to prove that when you're when when one million people are being treated for something, it's 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 also tricky to say. Well, some of those people were going to have a stroke. You know, there's a certain probability of of every year a thousand people having a stroke, or probably much more, probably a hundred thousand people having a stroke. So now some of those are going to overlap with the injection uh, with the vaccine. So it's very, it is very difficult, but, but I'm sorry if I'm um, you know, digressing. It, but you know, it's sort of an operating system problem, as you say, you know, we are, we are still running Windows 7 yeah. in the world of Mac OS 13. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. You know, all that stuff remains, uh, all of our fears, all of our, you know, sort of heuristics uh, that were transferred through generations, all of those remain. I mean, if you go get into an aircraft, you say, am I going to get from X to Y safely? Yeah. No, there's no 100%, uh, there's no 100% event, yeah. but this is the safest mode of transportation that we yeah. have ever invented. Yeah. So you shouldn't have a fear getting into an aircraft ever, right? I mean, this is the safest mode of transportation that we have ever, ever invented. And then so somebody the concept, yeah. Yeah. And then somebody who doesn't like flying might say, Yeah, but I heard one crashed <laughs> two years ago. And they're right, it did crash. And if somebody said, Well, somebody died because of the vaccine, well, so maybe somebody did die because of the vaccine. But probabilistically, they're not even close in terms of the chances that will um, benefit you and others versus that it will harm. So I think people have trouble absorbing that. Let me give you one example since you brought up flying. Um during 9-11, um, I think 3,000 people died as a d direct consequence of the attacks on um, at the Pentagon and the World Trade Center. What a lot of people don't know is that in the year after that, it's estimated that another 1,000 people died because of fear of flying. So 
when they look at the number of fatal car accidents in the year after 9-11, there was an excess deaths of approximately 1,000 to 2,000 people. Oh, wow. Yeah, I didn't it know that. It seems to be that even though flying after 9-11 was still by far the safest mode of transport, people, understandably so, developed a fear of flying, and that drove people to drive more. So that fear, again, in, although in a low probability context, um, ended up killing a certain number of people. So again, it's our outdated fear circuits, our, our, um, pro our difficulty in sort of balancing the probability of the safety of flights with the fear of flights that ended up um, increasing the death rate significantly as a result of 9-11. Yeah, I mean, that's fascinating. I mean, in, in the case of the vaccine, there's a network effect. So when you take a vaccine, you are protecting not only yourself, but society in general, right? So there's a, there's a huge network effect uh, from taking a vaccine. Um, yeah. I mean, we can quantify that, right? I mean, yeah, we, yeah. we can demonstrably show it is, a, it is a dominant decision by any stretch of the imagination. Um, but uh, seems seems like we are failing in the U.S. a little bit. Uh, so, so I want to touch on a couple of uh, your other papers: uh, temporal perceptual learning, our interaction with the environment. You say that each other is incredibly time varying in nature. It is not surprising that the nervous systems of animals have evolved sophisticated mechanisms to not only tell time but to listen, but to learn to discriminate and produce temporal patterns. It is some of the most sophisticated human behaviors such as speech and music would not exist if the human brain was unable to learn to discriminate and produce temporal patterns. So we, we probably we probably got the software update early <laughs> in terms of finding time. And then we started using it, a lot of interesting things, right? Speech and music and, and speech uh, specifically really propelled us to the next next level of development. So, yeah, all animals have the ability to do sensory and motor timing. They can determine, um, they can time when a predator will launch into a flight, like a cat catching a bird. You were giving the example of cricket, right? A, a cat jumping into the air to catch a bird is an incredibly impressive <laughs> example of good, good timing as well. Um, but clearly humans have um, further um, perfected our ability to tell time on that time scale of hundreds of milliseconds to seconds. But I got to say, I think most animals have that ability. I think what's highly unique about humans um, is our ability to engage conceptualized time and to engage in what's called mental time travel. So what one of the things that makes Homo sapiens sapien is our ability to think about the future, right? So if you think about something like agriculture, you know, the idea is really not that complicated, is, is, it, is it, Gil, right? It's not, you don't need to be Einstein to come up with the idea that of planting a seed, taking care of it, and then having food in the future. But it took, no other animal has come up with a concept of agriculture, only humans, as far as we know. And part of the reasons that's so hard is because it involves traveling outside the present moment into the long-term future. So that's called mental time travel and building a blade or like, so you, so using a tool. It's not only using the tool, but it's imagining that this tool will be of use in the future. And that's something again, that animals. So it's fascinating to ask, how is it that we are able to engage in mental time travel? And why do most animals not seem to have that ability? So almost everything you and I do, right? Whether we um, go to bed early because we want to get up early or we put gas or charge the car because we're going to use it tomorrow or we brush our teeth because we want to be healthy um, in, in when, we, when we get old. So most of those things are foreign concepts to animals. Your cat or your dog are not going to follow why you're doing those actions um, because they're beyond their temporal outlook. And so that's a fascinating question about how we conceptualize time. Yeah, so do you see a difference, uh, Dean, between prediction and forecasting? Um, the reason I ask is uh, prediction doesn't necessarily have a temporal 
dimension. So given, you know, in a supervised machine learning context, given a bunch of data, I can predict something. Forecasting, on the other hand, is about timing. Yeah. So, so do you think humans uh, really developed an, the ability to forecast as opposed to predict? Yeah, I think that's a great question, Gil. I, it would be interesting to talk about to know what other people uh, define those two terms, but I think most of the people would agree with your definition. But a lot of times when when I at least say prediction, I often do mean it has a temporal component. So your example is the following. Well, it's going to, the, the weather forecaster says it's going to rain. Well, <laughs> rain when, right? So your point is, is that a weather caster, uh, a weather person that just says it's going to rain isn't a very good, um, forecaster, right? They need to tell, well, is it going to rain tomorrow or the day after? Now, when we talk about prediction, we talk about, for example, um, reward prediction. So an animal will predict if they'll get a reward. Often there is a temporal component to that, but it's true that most animal prediction is very short time scale. So it is pretty immediate. So, but animals, as you know, will learn to predict, say, a reward but they'll also learn that that reward will might be delayed so if a cat hears you opening the fridge they know that maybe food will be coming but they can also learn that that food will take 10 seconds or 30 seconds or 40 seconds um so i think in the case of of the brain of most animals i think prediction and forecasting sort of co-evolved but you're correct that there is something more basic about prediction and just knowing something will happen irregardless of when or sort of just immediately. So there's a timing window, the timing yeah. window question, right? So seconds or minutes for animals, um, you know, I'm thinking about literature, Dean. So when you sit down and write a novel or something like that, you know, that, that's a very complex uh, phenomenon, <laughs> right? I mean, very much. You, you have to anticipate human behavior, you have to sort of make that happen over a long period of time. And agriculture, as you mentioned, is a sort of a similar concept. Um, you, you know, many months, if not years, before you actually reap the rewards. And so I think we have become very good at sort of long-term forecasting or whatever you want to call it, prediction. Yeah. We, we substantially expanded the window that that we can actually work in, right? Yeah. I think the way I, I think about it is that humans, we are, I do believe that we're the only species that can engage in that long-term prediction um, or long-term um, preparation or long-term mental time travel. But at the same time, I would, so that makes us happy, right? Wow, we're the only animals that can do that. <laughs> yeah. But at the same time, we sort of suck at it. <laughs> So um, it's not, we should be so, so much better, um, right? In terms of saving enough for retirement, taking care of our health, and most notably today is climate change, right? We're taking, while we're able to make good long-term decisions, we're not very good at it, I would argue. Um, and again, if you look at human behavior, I think that's pretty clear that, um, many of the problems we face in society are really a consequence of our lack of long-term thinking. Maybe we wish we had studied more in college. Maybe we wish we had um, worked harder um, towards achieving this goal versus that goal, or we took better care of our health, or we saved more money for retirement, or took better care of the environment. So I think this is a real test of humankind. Um, in terms of wanting to make better long-term decisions as to better short-term decisions. And by the way, this goes back to the vaccine op conversation, right? Um, so those are long-term decisions that will improve our long-term outcome. Yeah, perhaps, Dean, our brains are not as good as we think they are. So yeah. the, the tool maker from the African savanna, right? Um, the tool maker's horizon was pretty short. I would imagine. Um, take the stone, shape it into a tool with an objective of killing an animal next day, maybe next week. <laughs> I don't know. I mean, you know, it's still short horizon thinking, right? Yeah. 
and we lived through that for 100,000 years. So perhaps we are sort of imagining our brains to be more powerful <laughs> than they really are. I couldn't agree more, Gil. Yeah, yeah. I think we, we a dose of humility um, in terms of recognizing the brain's amazing features is great, but I think we need to put more effort into recognizing the brain's flaws, and that will allow us to better remediate or address those flaws and make better decisions. Yeah, so, so I want to conclude with, um, what does your sort of gut feel about, I mean, we are on a lot of different tracks, right? Neuroscience, you guys are doing so much, so many interesting stuff. We are understanding more and more of the brain, but we are, we are not getting any closer to sort of a fundamental understanding. Uh, cosmology, similar sort of a thing. There's a lot, lot being done, but we don't get to sort of fundamental understanding there either. A um, lot of social sciences arena. Um, it's unclear that we really understand, you know, sort of the very complex dynamics of the world. So as you, as you look forward, uh, the, uh, two questions. Do you think we are making progress? in science as a loaded question. And number two, if we are, where do you think we will be, say 10, 15 years from now? Yeah. Well, I, I I have, thanks for setting the first question up. Yeah, but I mean, <laughs> I think it's clear that we're making progress in science, but that's, an, that's a low bar, right, Gil? I think the, the question, if you ask me, well, should we have been making more? Should we have been far advanced? And that, that gets much more complicated. But there's no doubt that we're still making uh, significant progress. And, and the fact that we have a new mRNA vaccine is, 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 is incredible proof of that. Um, and we're making progress in understanding the brain as well. But it's, as most scientific progress, it's um, stepwise progress. It's step by painful step. And that's the way, that's what it's hard for a lot of people outside of science to understand, that it's a very, very slow process. And, you know, we're not that bright. <laughs> um, so I don't, I don't think that's that surprising. Um, so I think we just have to recognize that. But we're certainly making progress. But it's never as fast as we would like it to be. And that's, that's just the way it is. Now, in terms of where we're going to be, yeah, I mean, you you gave us three areas, sociology, neuroscience, and say cosmology. Yeah, I think in, in, in many ways, you know, I think the comparison between the big problems in cosmology, the origin of the universe, and uh, neuroscience, the big question, consciousness, I think those are interesting um, contrasts, right? In cosmology, you know, there's a still a lot of debate going on in terms of, okay, well, what the hell happened before the Big Bang or what caused the Big Bang? And and progress in that uh, area is very difficult. But, you know, they have a really damn good excuse, right? Because it only happened once and it happened 14 billion years ago and they can't do the experiment again. <laughs> now, neuroscientists don't have that excuse. You know, we have six billion, seven billion brains on the planet. Consciousness is always going on and off. You know, I, it seems to me we should have made more progress on that problem um, because in principle, we have the means to study it, right? I mean, every night, if you're interested in consciousness, every night you turn your consciousness off and you turn it back on in the morning. Um, so, it's, so it seems that the problem is a lot more tractable than say cosmology. Um, but maybe, maybe the brain simply isn't capable of understanding itself, right? It's a possibility I think we have to consider. Um, and where will we be in 10 years? I don't think neuroscience will have been making any fundamental quantum paradigm shifts like going from Newtonian mechanics to relativity. I think the progress is going to be relatively slow and step by step in neuroscience. I don't, I don't think like 10 years from now, the neuroscience landscape will look will have identified one ground, one earth shattering law or rule that has shaped or changed our view of how the brain works, in my opinion. I hope I'm wrong though. <laughs> yeah, so, so now I'm just thinking, Dean, that um, 
the, these are you know, clearly two different domains, uh, different data sets, uh, different ways of understanding things. Uh, as you say, you have 8.4 billion experiments going on on Earth in terms of the brain. Um, presumably, we can collect a lot of data around that. But but your fundamental question is, you know, this question remains: is is the thing that you're studying is able to understand itself? We don't have we don't have such a thing in any other field, right? So this is a recursive uh, complication here um, that the question is, can we ever get over that recursion problem? Yeah. Uh, that's exactly right. And and it is a recursive problem. And thanks for not saying it's also a type of narcissism, right? Because, <laughs> because the, so it's the brain sort of studying itself can be interpreted as a bit narcissistic. But yeah, it's neuroscience is absolutely unique because it's the only scientific field in which the thing being studied is studying itself. And, you know, that's a tall order. So I don't I don't know the answer. Do you do you, do you think it will be able to understand itself? Well, I don't know anything about it. Um, I do some work in AI, as you know. Um, the other question I want to ask you quickly, I, I feel like the computer scientists may have led neuroscientists through the wrong path. <laughs> uh, as far as I can see, there is no connection between how the brain works. And you talk about this, you know, the, the neuron hardware is significantly different from the transistor hardware that we work with. And drawing an analogy between the two seems like it's a, it's really a bad thing in the sense that it might it might just lead us <laughs> to the yeah. wrong, wrong path. So artificial intelligence, that's also a wrong terminology because it is not intelligence by any stretch of the imagination. It's just algorithms and mathematics. And we have known that for a while. Uh, we just have faster computers now. Um, and so, do you, do you think there's a, there's a problem with sort of computer scientists, you know, making connections to the brain? I don't see any connection personally. Do you? Well, this is is a well debated point as well. And I think I agree with the perspective that. AI, and by AI, I'm referring to, say, deep neural networks, convolutional neural networks, or current neural networks. I think they were inspired in some way by how the brain works, um, in just the sense that you have these relatively simple units that are highly interconnected and that learn to do computations based on adjusting the weights. Um, that's, of course, an incredible simplification of how the brain works. But I think it's it's fair to say that um, they that that branch of AI was inspired by how the brain works and captures some aspects of how the brain works. Now, I think we're getting to this point where neuroscientists might start learning from um, the machine learning field and machine learning, I think, field still has some things to learn from um, neuroscience. But I think they also might split apart because if you're just interested in machine learning and artificial intelligence and maybe even artificial general intelligence, AGI, you know, there's no reason you really have to be mold your approach on neuroscience. There's no reason really to think that the bi biology has the unique patent or the unique right to create truly intelligent systems. There might be better ways to do it. Biology is limited by evolution. Evolution is really not that great of a designer, right? And the hardware is limited. You know, there's a reason that, you know, evolution never came up with wheels. Wheels are a pretty good invention, but they're hard to implement with biological tissue. So it could be that um, as AI and machine learning continue to develop, just taking a parallel route will lead to intel truly intelligent systems um, that are do not are not based on how the brain actually works. But um, it could be, it could not be. I don't know what. The, it wouldn't surprise me if that goes that way. To put it, um, give you my yeah. opinion. I want to ask you one one final question, Dean. So I don't know if you talk about this in your book. Um, 
One of the deficiencies of the brain is sort of the electrochemical communication um, process. Uh, it is slow. It is not that scalable uh, in some ways. So do you think we are reaching, you know, sort of the limit of the brain uh, because of the communication deficiencies? Well, I think the brain from a biological perspective has, in, has sort of ceased to continue to evolve in any dramatic way. So in that sense, I think it's not going to um, evolve or, or continue to enhance in that much way. Now, it could be that through genetic engineering in future generations decide to come up with ways to try to expand it. But there are fundamental constraints that are really biophysical constraints. The big one is the one you just mentioned, for example, right? You know, um, uh, silicon computers, you know, they are incredibly fast and that speed is ultimately constrained by the laws of physics, but on many orders of magnitude um, faster uh, rates than the human brain. Biology just relying on the influx of, of, of ions and the outflux of ions to con transmit information is incredibly slow and the biology has done the best it could given those constraints. And this is getting to the point that, well, maybe future um, AI approaches can further abandon the architecture the brain uses because much of the architecture the brain uses was really a, um, a compromise between an optimal solutions to a problem and the raw materials that it had at its disposal. Yeah, I mean, I, I can see humans walking around with a bunch of quantum computers hanging yeah. hanging on their shoulders, yeah. um, you know, sort of supplementing uh, their brain power. But let's hope that doesn't happen. <laughs> <laughs> it, it won't be human anymore. Uh, so, so excellent, Dean. This has been great. Thanks so much for spending time with me. Thank you, Gil. It's been a very stimulating conversation. Thank you.